Look, I get it. Sometimes you need a little cosmic help. Whether it's generating riches or amassing mindless followers to do your bidding, sometimes human abilities fall short. That's where summoning Lovecraftian monsters comes in. Countless witches and warlocks have tried it to various degrees of success. Hell, there are all sorts of cults out there downright devoted to calling forth some monstrous abominations. But we have to be realistic here, some just aren't worth the risk of summoning. If you end the world or give up your entire sanity in the process, what did you really gain? Hello horror heads and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host Keegan Hughes and today we're going to be counting down the Top 5 Scary Lovecraftian Monsters You Should Never Summon. Don't lock away your Necronomicon quite yet, I'm sure there are some starter horrors you can call upon, just maybe not any that we talk about in this video. Before we get started, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more mind-rending madness. Perfect. Let's begin. Coming in at number 5, we've got Nyagtha. It's debatable whether this fiend is an avatar of Nyarlathotep or not, but for the purpose of this video, we'll assume that Nyagtha is a beast of its very own. Although being a part of Nyarlathotep would also earn you a spot on this list. Best described as inky black shadows, Nyagtha is a great old one that often shows up in the Cthulhu mythos. Best known from its appearance in Henry Cutner's The Salem Horror, it can strike fear deep into the heart of just about anyone. Some folks call it the thing that should not be, which is quite the moniker. Imagine being so horrid that your title describes a preferred state of existence where you just aren't real. Sheesh. Niagtha can be summoned to the Earth's surface from secret caverns and fissures. Some say that it originates from Lang, while others have seen it in all sorts of places. Regardless, once summoned to Earth, it is very difficult to get rid of. The amorphous mass made up of an unnameable sticky black substance causes chaos and mayhem wherever it roams. Tentacles sprout from its body to interact with the world around it, choking and crushing all it comes across. After the accidental reincarnation of the witch, Abigail Prynne, Niagtha was summoned to the surface. Luckily, an occultist was ready with the necessary tools to send it back. Only through the use of a ritual using an Ankh, a special elixir, and an incantation can Niagtha be sent back to its dimension. So if you're not prepared with all three of those things, I'd say don't summon it. Although I'm sure some folks would love to see it run free. Coming in at number four, we've got Groth. There is absolutely no way that the moon from Majora's Mask wasn't in some way inspired by this Lovecraftian deity. I remember being scared silly by that constantly encroaching, horrid-faced lunar body as a kid, and honestly, I still sort of am now. Unavoidable destruction slowly making its way towards you, and there is nothing you can do to stop it. Well, actually in Zelda there was a way to stop it, but in real life, we're pooched. That is what makes Groth so terrifically terrifying. It's a living planetoid, originally created by Ramsey Campbell. It sort of looks like a gigantic red-brown moon with a huge red eye smack dab in the middle. On the surface, it is composed of iron, ash, and gas, and beneath the crust, there are vast seas churning, making up that eye. As it drifts through the universe, Groth will close its eye in order to avoid detection. All the while, it sings a siren song known as the Music of Spheres. You know, because moons are spheres. This tune will awaken any sleeping great ones and outer gods that may be close enough to hear. And of course, the awakening of these beings often means massive destruction. This isn't the only way Groth can cause mayhem though. It also enjoys destroying entire planets itself. In fact, now that I think about it, Groth is a bit like a natural sentient death star. No exhaust ports either. One notable planetary destruction involved blasting the home of Baug Zuka Mog to smithereens, forcing the bringer of pestilence to move to Earth where it now resides. Like, come on, man, we've got enough going on without deadly interplanetary scorpions taking up residence. And to make matters worse, we can't even spend our last moments in peace and harmony. As Groth gets closer to planets that it intends to destroy, they experience insane natural disasters. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, tidal waves, wicked storms, you name it. It doesn't seem like Groth tends to cut deals with humans either, so strike this one off your summoning bucket list. Coming in at number three, we've got the Zothic Demon Trio. Lynn Carter penned a series of short stories based on the Cthulhu mythos, featuring three terrible deities. Sons of Cthulhu. These terrible monsters inspired much in terms of cult worship and mystical artifacts, which led to a smorgasbord of human suffering. In the cycle, scholars head on expeditions to discover the artifacts related to these gods. Of course, many are driven mad just by their presence. Often these gods will enter people's dreams, not unlike their father. And they inspired madness encouraging bloodthirsty cults, too. The apple does not fall far from the tree, apparently. The youngest son is Zothamog. This cone-shaped, razor-fanged freak has gigantic starfish arms and a mane of tentacles. He lives at the bottom of the sea, waiting to be set free. Next up is Yathogtha, the second son. It appears as a gigantic humanoid frog cyclops. 
Yathagtha is so large that its fingertips are often mistaken for mountainous heads. Some say that it can only be measured in miles. Imprisoned in an abyss, it is served by the Yugs and their lord Ub. The first and most fearsome son of Cthulhu is known as Gatnathoa. Horrid in appearance and in power, this Gorgon-like being takes great pleasure in immobilizing people and leaving their minds intact. Their consciousness is trapped in an immobile shell forever, causing them to go mad. The cult worshipping him was once the most powerful on the continent, but has since fallen from grace thanks to intervention from some elder gods. All three power-hungry mini Cthulhus have been imprisoned for eons and are just waiting for their chance to break free and rule some worlds. Don't give them that opportunity. Coming in at number two, we've got Haster, the king in yellow, the unspeakable one, he who is not to be named. Originally described as the god of shepherds, Haster has since taken many forms. Some know him as the feaster from afar, a black shriveled monster with razor-tipped tentacles. The feaster pierces people's skulls and sucks out their brains. Haster was first mentioned in Robert W. Chambers' The King in Yellow. The collection of short stories centers around a fictional play sharing the same name as the collection's title. After a relatively benign first act, it will drive readers insane with an absolutely wicked act too. Lovecraft was so enamored with the idea of this king in yellow that he started to include elements in his own stories. Haster takes many forms in Lovecraft's tales and can be interpreted as a person, place, object, or god. Everything seems to come back to the cult of Haster and Carcosa. Have you seen the yellow sign? And finally, at number one, we've got Yog sothoth Now, if there is a Lovecraftian monster with a reputation for being summoned, it has to be Yog sothoth the all seeing outer god, progenitor of Cthulhu and Haster. Yogg's Thoth is often called upon to assist mortals in performing all manners of occult deeds and rituals. Two particularly famous instances are in the case of Charles Dexter Ward and the Dunwich Horror, both written by H.P. himself. In the case of Charles Dexter Ward, Yogg's Thoth is mostly mentioned in passing. At some point, the main antagonist, Joseph Kerwin, managed to summon Yogg's to gain forbidden knowledge. Kerwin, along with his other warlock and occultist buddies, used this knowledge for evil, although the extent of which is up for debate. A prime example of this would be using certain cosmic powers to bring people back to life through their essential salts, which he did later to himself in order to take over his great-great-great-grandson's life. In the Dunwich Horror, Yogg-Sothoth actually manages to create two half-human offspring during a visit to Earth. It seems that Grandpa Waitley was greatly interested in the occult and managed to summon the All-Seer to Earth to mate with his daughter. This produced two terrifying beings, the titular barn-sized Horror and Wilbur. The latter of the two was much more human, but not quite human enough to avoid being a total pariah. He aged quickly, reaching full maturity in about a decade, and was taught dark rituals by his grandfather. Other than being a gross nuisance, Wilbur didn't cause too much trouble. His brother, however, bore a striking resemblance to their father. In fact, once it was left alone following the deaths of Grandpa Waitley and Wilbur, Yogg Jr. broke free of the barn and went on a rampage through Dunwich. Only an experienced team of occult scholars from Miskatonic could put a stop to all this. Now, these are only a couple examples of what might happen if you summon Yogg's at Thoth, but you can be sure any knowledge or power it grants you will come at a grave cost. Weigh your options before making a deal or performing any rituals. Hopefully I conjured up enough nightmares for you never to summon any of these Lovecraftian monsters. The cosmos is vast and we are quite small. I don't know if we're ready for anything more. What did you think of the list? Have you ever attempted a Necronomic Summon? Which Lovecraftian monster is your favorite? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your more horadric ones from the top five SCP monsters that can never escape part 19. Chiru says, the other night I dreamed I was an SCP witnessing my own containment followed by a bout of sleep paralysis. Good job, brain. What do you think your subconscious is trying to tell you? Time to develop some anomalous powers, haunt some people, become a monster in your own right? Connor Crow Delderfield says, this guy talks like he's still in the 90s and I love it. Keeping the dream of the 90s alive. I don't even live in Portland. Radio TSM operator Teddy Timmis says, Useful information for y'all. Since I am such a hardcore SCP fan, even since its conception when that 4 chan made the first SCP entry many, many years ago, I have saved all of the SCP-related documents. Agent files, mobile task force information, addendums, etc, etc. In case the SCP Foundation gets hacked or something, I am happy to share all the stories back. Good looking out, Teddy Timmis. Glad to hear folks are backing up all the sensitive documents. KRTXY says, If they can't escape, what's the point of this list? SMSH. Well, I mean, mostly to talk about interesting SCPs, I suppose. Are you upset? Lycron says, I love these videos, but they just don't have the same effect in the middle of the day. Looks like I have to rewatch the video at 3 a.m. You'll absorb the info better on a second watch and with the added effect of extra creepiness. It's a win-win. 
And Marina Lozic asks, does a sofa count as a bed? Because if it doesn't, I'm completely safe. Well, that actually brings up a very interesting question. Do pull-up beds count? Would 078 only manifest when it's in bed mode? Or would it work for anybody sleeping on it? Much to think about. And that's all the time we have for today. Before I hit the eject button without bringing a parachute, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more Mondo Monsters. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. I'm your horror host, Keegan Hughes, and today, did I say horror heads or horror hosts before? The amorphous mass made up in a lip, although I'm sure some folks would love to, mm -hmm, yep. That is what makes Groth so terrifically, terrifically terrifying. <laughs> sort of, sure. We'll stick with that. And ever since... Oh, a prime example of this would be... <coughs> wow. Hopefully I conjured up a night... You know, I need more water. And up all the sensitive documents. Glad to hear folks are knocking up, knocking up all the sensitive documents.